and welcome to the first lesson in the series on software. Do you remember during the series on hardware, we discussed the difference between hardware and software? If you remember, hardware is everything you can see and touch, like the keyboard, the mouse, and the screen. In fact, even components inside the computer box, like this hard drive, would be considered hardware. The main difference between hardware and software is that you cannot touch software. Software is the programs and information that are loaded onto the computer. Having software on a computer is like giving the computer a brain. Why? Because without software, a computer would not be capable of processing data. It would be a useless piece of machinery. During this series, we will be focusing on the software component of a computer. By the end of today's lesson, you should be able to explain the term software, state the purpose of software in a computer system, and describe the history of software. Do you remember during the series on hardware, we looked at the purpose of a hard drive and how the hard drive works? Mm -hmm. Then you know that the hard drive is the hardware and anything that is stored on the hard drive is called the software. We can therefore say that the hard drive is the medium that holds the software. Without software on the hard drive, it would be like a piece of metal unable to store or hold information. So in other words, hardware and software need to work together in order for processing to take place. Yes, Eli. Another example to illustrate this would be a CD. The CD is the medium and the information on the CD is the software. Without the CD, the information could not be stored and therefore no processing could take place. Most software on your computer comes in the form of programs. A program consists of a set of instructions that tells the hardware what to do and how to behave. Remember, we learned about input, processing and output during the hardware lessons. We saw that whenever the computer needs to do processing, it must use a set of instructions that tells the CPU what to do with all the input data. This set of coded instructions is software. There are thousands of different software programs on the market that you can buy and run on your computer, depending on what you use your computer for. These software programs fall into two main categories, application software and system software. Using application software, you can type letters, do mathematical calculations, create graphics and even make a movie. You can either buy application software to suit your purpose or you can develop a program to solve a specific problem or perform a particular task. During the hardware lessons, we saw Salai doing a school project using a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet such as Excel is an example of an application software package that you can buy. You see, I understand what application software is, but can you explain system software? System software is needed to control, support and run the computer. An example of system software is an operating system. One of the functions of an operating system is to allow hardware devices to talk to each other. It also controls how hardware devices work. I've heard of an operating system. Aren't Unix, Windows and Linux examples of an operating system? Yes, indeed they are. All computers have to have an operating system to control and manage the hardware components. For example, when you want to start or shut down your computer, it is the operating system software that carries out these instructions. So the term operating system is a name given to the software responsible for the direct control and management of the hardware. The operating system is the first software package loaded onto the computer's hard drive. All the other software that gets loaded afterwards depends on the operating system software because it provides the basic operating instructions. That's why it's called an operating system. Hmm. 
Hmm, so let me get this right. When I turn on a computer, it is the operating system screen that I'm looking at. That's correct. As you can see, it holds a menu of all the application packages that have been loaded onto this computer. I'm curious, who was the genius that wrote the first program? It was a lady by the name of Ada Lovelace. I knew it, it had to be a woman. <laughs> well, let me tell you something about Ada. Her full name was Augusta Ada King. She later became Countess of Lovelace. Ada was the only child of Lord Byron and his wife Annabella. Annabella was interested in mathematics and taught Ada this art from a very young age. She was also privately schooled in both mathematics and science. In 1835, she married William King, the first Earl of Lovelace, making her Countess Lovelace. In 1833, Ada met a man by the name of Charles Babbage. Babbage was an inventor of a programmable calculating machine called the analytical engine. Ada was fascinated by his ideas and followed his work enthusiastically. She started communicating with Babbage about the workings of his innovative machine. Ada suggested to Babbage that she write a plan on how the engine might generate a sequence of Bernoulli numbers which depends on complex mathematical calculations. In 1843, Ada published her plan in an article on the workings of the analytical engine. Her plan is now regarded as the first computer program. In 1979, a software language developed by the U.S. Department of Defense using Ada's concept was named Ada in her honor. Oh man, that is so romantic. Are there any other famous women involved in the development of software? Actually, Salai, from this point on, it seems as if men had the spotlight. However, it took about a hundred years before another major breakthrough in software took place. All right, so can you tell us about these other developments in software? Well, before we look at the next major software development, I think it's important to mention that while software was being developed, so was hardware. Without these hardware developments, no software would have been developed. One of these hardware developments was in 1937 when the first electronic computer was created. The inventor was John Vincent Atanasoff, together with his partner Clifford Berry. They called this model the ABC and spent the next two years improving it. The final product was about the size of a disc, weighed around 320 kilograms and contained one and a half kilometers of wires. It could calculate about one operation every 15 seconds, while today a computer can calculate about 150 billion operations in about 15 seconds. This computer was too large to go anywhere and remained in the physics department of the university where they worked. This computer worked by means of a machine code which uses binary. We discuss binary in the hardware lessons. Can you remember what it is? Hmm, I think it's when a computer uses ones and zeros to turn a circuit on or off. One means on and zero means off. That's right. Actually, a man called Claude Shannon wrote a thesis around this time on how binary logic could be used with electronic circuitry. Binary logic is software that allows computers to communicate with hardware components by turning switches on and off. Shannon's thesis created a lot of interest and many people started experimenting with machinery that could use binary logic with electronic circuitry. This is the basis of how all computer programs work today. With all this interest in technology, many new and exciting developments were now possible. This period was the start of what is known as the information age. In the beginning of this new and exciting age, programs were not stored neatly on a stiffy disk or CD for easy installation as they are today. The only way to program a computer was to manually plug and unplug the thousands of electronic switches from the machine. This would allow the programmer to turn the switches on and off as required. Then came another step forward. A more powerful computer called the ENIAC was invented around 1945. 
The INIAC is considered by many to be the world's first digital computer. During World War II, the American military were looking for a machine that could calculate ballistic firing tables. These were needed to ensure that shells fired from battleships were accurate. This is a picture of the ENIAC computer. If you look at the picture, you can see why programming this machine meant that it had to be totally rewired each time. As a result, calculations done by this computer needed days of preparation in which thousands of wires, resetting switches and plugs were handled. Yeah, I can imagine how difficult the job was. I mean, working with so many wires and if you make a mistake, then sure. Oh, did they experience many technical problems? Actually, it was around this time that the term software bug first materialized. Oh, hold on. What is a software bug? Let me explain. Also in 1945, Grace Murray Hopper was working on the Harvard University Mark II Aiken Relay Calculator, which was a very old computer. The machine started experiencing problems and after weeks of searching for the problem, it was found that a moth had lodged itself in one of the circuits. This prevented the computer from working correctly. The technician removed the moth and stuck it onto the report with a common saying, first actual case of bug being found. In fact, I have a picture of the log. Have a look. From that day on, the term bug was used for any computer program error that needed fixing. Also of interest is that the researchers who developed the first computers were also the programmers and the users. They worked directly on the hardware, rewiring the circuitry each time they programmed the machine. Remember, there were no operating systems or application programs in those days. These researchers wrote their programs in a language called assembly language. Assembly language is a human readable code that can also be understood by a computer. As you know, computers only understand binary, which is ones and zeros. So, one, zero, one, one, zero, 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 one, one, zero, 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 one would be very easy for the computer to understand, but difficult for humans. On the other hand, if this same code was written in assembly language, it would be easier for programmers to understand. Assembly language for this same binary code looks something like this. At that time, when a program ran, it took total control of the whole computer, which meant that any running program had complete control of the entire computer. Because the computer could only work by rewiring and reprogramming the machine, it meant that only one programmer could use a computer at a time. As a result, there were many researchers competing for limited computing time in the research lab. The solution to this time problem was to have programmers develop their programs without having access to the actual computer. Sure, how could you do that? The only way this was possible was to develop paper tapes and punch cards. Paper tape is actually a roll of paper tape with holes punched into it. These holes represent the programmable characters. Punch cards are similar to paper tape. The characters are punched into a card and so the program could be completed without having access to the actual computer. When the programmer wanted to run the program, the cards or tapes were inserted into the computer and the program would run. This development was important because now the data or information could be stored, it became possible to read the data at a later stage. This was in fact the start of the operating system environment. The problem, however, was the possibility of incorrectly typing a single zero or one on the cards or tape. You can imagine how easily that could happen. It was therefore only a matter of time before someone realized that the method of using cards and paper tape to store data was not ideal. Hmm, so what happened next? In 1949, the Manchester Mark I was built in Britain by Max Newman, a mathematics professor. 
It was the first computer that used electronically stored programs. This meant that, for the first time, programs could be stored inside the computer. Paper tapes and punch cards were no longer necessary. Oh, I'm sure the fact that a computer could store a program internally must have been a huge breakthrough in the development of computers. One of the first true real-time core control systems, or as it is known today, operating systems, was developed around the late 1950s. It was called SAGE and was developed by IBM to monitor weapon systems. Then, in the mid-1970s, the world's first portable operating system called Unix was developed. It had the capability of being easily ported or moved to any computer. Before the invention of Unix, programmers had to go to research labs to run their programs. Having a portable operating system meant that computers would now be accessible to more people. This was a major advantage and led to the widespread use of Unix in colleges and universities. From this point onwards, Unix became the forerunner in the development of operating systems. It was not until 1981 that Bill Gates founded Microsoft and developed its first operating system called DOS or Disk Operating System. You will remember that in the hardware series, we discussed monitors that were orange and black or green and black. These computers mostly used DOS. Microsoft released the first version of Windows around 1985. This was a huge breakthrough in the operating system environment as it used a graphic user interface. The graphic user interface allowed for a graphical way of selecting programs and made the computer environment more user-friendly. It was now easier for the average person in the street to use a computer. As you have seen, computers have come a long way since Ada Lovelace wrote the first program in 1833, and I'm sure they are destined for even bigger developments in the future. Well, that's all we have time for today. Here's your task. Draw a timeline of the important developments in computer software. State the two main categories of software. With the help of your teacher, check your school computers to see what operating system software has been loaded. Thank you for joining us for our first lesson on software. For more information, please visit our website. Till next time, take care.